So I'm Tony Cashman, uh, director of a lot of things, I guess. But in this capacity, it's the Weiss Summer Research in the Humanities, Social Sciences, and Fine Arts. So if you're here about chemistry, or biology, or math, or econ, you're on the wrong flight, right? You can get up and leave it. Are you really? I am econ. Oh my god! So well, there is, so econ has their own program, and we have had econ students, but typically that's going to be through econ. Okay, have a great day. Okay, I saved you some time. And that was on a slide, that was going to be like three slides in. So it's like, you know, in the old days, I don't know, so in the old days before the really heavy security at airports, sometimes they would say, okay, this flight is going to Dallas. If you're on the wrong flight, you know, now is the time to get off. And occasionally somebody would get up and bolt off. <laughs> How the hell? Because they weren't scanning people in. They would just like look at your card and and send you in, but they weren't really paying attention. So, so we just we just saw that. Okay. Uh, so, as I said, I'm Tony Cashman, director of the Weiss Summer Research, but specifically in humanities, social sciences, and fine arts. I'm also the director of distinguished fellowships and graduate studies, and the director of the trial teams at HC, and the faculty advisor for the radio station. Right. So I have I wear a number of different hats, although my primary position is Director of Fellowships and Grad Studies. This is about a quarter of my job because we run this during the summer. Um, so you can see some of the experiential learning opportunities. So the J.D. Power Center for Liberal Arts in the World is really about making liberal arts college uh, relevant for students, right? You pay all this money to come here and you want to have marketable skills that help you get jobs when you get out of here. To make you know, those skills and those jobs make you happy alumni, and happy alumni give money back to the school, and it keeps the wheel turning. So we have a number of different opportunities. I'm not really going to talk about any of these. We're going to focus on life, but I always like to plug these. Academic internships, right? So this is the AIP program. Uh, students, once you become a junior or senior, you can earn academic credit for an internship, uh, typically in the community, sometimes they're remote but a lot of them take place right here in Worcester, which is nice. Uh, summer research is what we're going to be talking about. Of course, there's the Washington, D.C. semester, which is one of the finest programs at Holy Cross, and certainly in terms of D.C. programs, I would put, I would put ours against anybody's. Um, we have the Knight Fund, which is a way to fund independent research. Uh, the Knight Fund also funds a lot of what we do in summer research in terms of our travel budget uh, and equipment, stuff like that. And then there's community-based learning, which a lot of you have community-based learning now in your Montserrat classes, or those who have just come through Montserrat or are in Montserrat, uh, and they have other courses as well. Right? Learning, again, by doing out in the community. Okay, so this is our thing, though back on a sunny day uh, a long time ago. So why should you do this? I think all of these things are relevant. Uh, besides which, we, we pay you, and it's something to do during the summer. In a sense, I do always feel a little bit of guilt standing up here and trying to hype you up for the summer. When I was your age, I caddied right, at a golf course, and I made a lot of cash, and it was good for paying the bills. And it didn't matter so much that I hadn't acquired any real skills, you know, for the job place, you know, the marketplace, because that just wasn't the way of the world back in the 1980s. Now it is. Um, maybe if you're a first year rising sophomore working in the ice cream shop or the caddying, maybe that's okay. But especially after that, you're sort of losing ground to other people. So I apologize in advance for hype, but. I, but I don't want to blame it on the world. It's not my fault that the world is hyped up and expects you to have all these internships. I'm just here to facilitate this opportunity for you, okay? So I, I apologize for that. Um, and I think all these things are true. Some of this will be, it'll be personally enlightening and exciting for you, especially if you're pursuing something that you really love, but you will also uh, gather expertise in your field, right? Or in something that interests you. Okay, so this year we're going to run eight weeks from July 5th 
June 5th, excuse me, to July 28th. And we have upped the stipend another $25. I can't really claim much credit for that. That's mostly Professor Bertrand in the sciences, my counterpart in the sciences. He's really the one who pushes hard for those increases. And, and I think they finally got tired of listening to him, so they, they gave us another $25 per week, which is not much, but it's something, right? Uh, there's housing that's included, right? You don't pay anything for that. And you do get a meal contract, which comes out to be like 75 swipes, $190. Your faculty member, who's your advisor, gets paid. Uh, and even if you're on a team, the faculty member gets paid more for up to, I think, three people. And you're expected to work 40 hours a week. So that's really what we're asking from you. And it's full-time work, right? So that you can't work simultaneously during working hours, right? We expect you to be here during the working day. What you do uh, at night and on the weekends, if you want to work at a restaurant or whatever, we're certainly not going to hold you to that. You can go home on weekends or whatever, but we do kind of expect you here uh, during the week working those 40 hours. We have a weekly workshop every Tuesday uh, where we have sometimes presentations uh, that I or a colleague will make and towards the end, you do uh, presentations that we call the three-minute thesis. So everybody, by the end of the summer term, will have done or performed their three-minute thesis. Uh, and it is exactly what it sounds like. You talk about your project in three minutes. One slide, three minutes. It's fantastic. And we provide lunch every week. So this is uh, Tuesday at noon. And attendance is mandatory. We want you to be there unless you have some reason that you simply can't be there on a particular week or if you are traveling uh, for your research outside of Worcester. And then we expect you to present at the Summer Research uh, Symposium, which is, I think it's the Friday of the first full week in September. So not the first Friday, but the second Friday, typically uh, in September. And that's a poster, right? So you have to create a poster and do that. Okay, so this year we have funding from the McKay Family uh, Grant, which will allow us probably, the terms haven't been worked out entirely, we don't want summer research, we don't want the pay, which doesn't come out to be very much, $450 a week, we don't want that to be an obstacle to students with high need, right? Sometimes students with high need, high financial need, say, I just can't do it, I need to make more money than that. So there is funding uh, available, but it will be based off of financial need. It won't be, I'd like more money. Yeah, definitely, I understand that part. But it will be based upon a student's financial need. So we will consult with financial aid on that. They have not determined how much additional money that would be. So you come and, you'll come and see me, and we'll talk about it. And we'll get your, your name and your details, and we'll start working on that. Okay, so you can see the fields that we have here. And this was the slide where our student would have got up and left. Economics runs their own summer research program, and we have had an economics student in the past who did something that was more like uh, public policy, social policy, so not you know, the economics research that they do there. But almost everything else is fair game, right? Everything that's not a STEM field. And you can also do interdisciplinary majors and concentrations. You can do topics that are not strictly majors here, but might be, you know, and I think in the past we had people do health studies. I know that is a major now. But if you were working on something that would be adjacent to your major, but certainly involved in what you're working on, that's fantastic. Uh, we can definitely do that. And that's, you know, down here where it says subjects not covered in traditional summer science research programs. This gives you a certain amount of latitude to put some ideas together for yourself. Okay, so we're only going with rising sophomores, juniors, and rising seniors. No graduating seniors in this. That We used to do that, it's been a few years, but HR has definitely said no more graduating seniors. Because once students graduate, we don't really have any leverage over them anymore. And so they don't, we can't do that anymore. So 
there's a wide variety of outcomes here. And I think starting at the bottom, I should probably put this at the top, but you're not writing a book way too big, right? This is eight weeks. A blog would be a little bit too short, but we also don't want to say you have to produce this. You know, We want to see a 30 page paper by the end of that. That's not it at all. We have students that produce a lot of different products. And that's really delightful for us. Uh, if you're in the fine arts, you might be producing something that would be, you know, say, a visual art, you know, studio artwork. It might be, uh, if you're in theater or in English, maybe you're working on poetry or, or a screenplay or something to that effect, a play, a scene. Those are possibilities. Most students probably do some sort of 30-page paper. Right? They do research and they come up with uh, a 30 page paper under the guidance of their, uh, their advisors. But again, it doesn't have to be that way. If you're in anthropology doing ethnography, right, which requires a tremendous amount of work, maybe you're thinking about a position paper if you're in sociology or political science. That would be terrific. Uh, if you're in history, maybe you're thinking about some sort of archive guide. Uh, or some exhibit even, right? We've had, so I'm married to Stephanie Ewell in the history department, and her summer researchers on two different occasions worked on exhibits that uh, came out the following year, right? Art history, this is one of the things that we've had art historians working with Cantor Gallery in the past, so there are all sorts of possibilities here. So, a few things here. You need to be ready to do the research, right? So sometimes students will say, I really want to do this. I'll say, OK, so what's your major? Who's your advisor? No, no, I'm, I'm this kind of major, and I don't know anything about this. You definitely want to know about what you're going to research. That's really important. So in some, uh, in some places, it's great to shift gears and start something new. But for summer research, not so much, right? You're going to have to have some background and connection to what you want to study because you need a certain amount of expertise. You need to get yourself a mentor, right? This is, you work directly in conjunction with an advisor. I'm going to talk about this relationship in a moment, but you can't do this on your own. You have to have an advisor who supports you in your proposal and then through the eight weeks. You want to think about what goals and outcomes you want and do those match what you have to offer, both in terms of your training, your skills, you have to put this together in terms of your proposal. You want to think about what the audience for your end product will be. So again, if, say if you were doing uh, research for an exhibit, a history exhibit at the Worcester Historical Museum, you want to think about what that audience is. That's going to be different than if you're writing a position paper that you might present to a politician or a term paper that you're going to present to your uh, advisor at the end of this, right? So you have to think about what you're trying to produce. Um, it would be helpful if you had a sense of what the research process is like, but that's kind of one of the things that you learn in doing this, right? So I wouldn't get too hung up on number five, but it's going to have its ups and downs, and it's a little bit more involved probably than you think. I mean, think about it. You're going to be working on something down eight hours a day, five days a week. Mm -hmm. That's a lot, right? Uh, I've done full-time research, and it's a grind in some respects. It can be great joy, it can be exciting, but it can be a grind as well. So you do want to think about that, and you always want to be thinking about, have I limited this enough? You know, what am, what am I researching? Have I delimited my subject enough that I can actually get something done at the end of this process? And then you want to make you want to think about this research as something that fits into your academic program here, and maybe even your career trajectory as well. So you don't necessarily want this to be like a one-off. If this then fits in with your broader interests, this might be uh, the starting point for further inquiry that you're going to do later on. Awesome. That's what we like to say. OK, so this is a good time for you to start thinking about your project. I know you have other things on your minds, because finals is coming up very quickly. 
but you still think about it this way, right? So there are only 20 of you in this room, and you're going to have a whole month, month and a half to be thinking about this that the people who go to the info session at the end of January are not going to have. This would be a great time for you to think about it, and even perhaps, hey there, um, talk to a professor that might be an advisor to you. It's definitely not too early for that. You want to start thinking about trying to line somebody up, coming up with your idea and lining somebody up. You want to think about arguments, right? Questions that lead to arguments because ultimately research is argumentative, right? You're trying to, you don't, you're not just looking into something for the sake of looking into it, you're trying to discover something, right, and find something out. You want to think about what kind of sources you're going to be using, especially primary sources. Will you need access to archives? Will you use sources that are online? Do you need databases? Are you going to be conducting interviews? Those are all questions that you need to ask and work out with your advisor. And of course, thinking about the outcomes, I mentioned all those different sort of outcomes um, on the previous page. And then in the application essay itself, the proposal, you do want to think about and communicate to us what sort of resources you might need. Um, we might have questions like, how are you going to do this? Do you have the resources for this? Uh, or you might not be uh, tipping your hand enough of like, here's what I really need to get this done. You certainly don't want to drop, you know, in third week, you don't want to drop on us, oh, I need to go away next week to an archive in Minnesota. Okay, you know, maybe, but probably not because we need to plan that out and help you execute that, right? Because there are certain restrictions and of course there's money involved. Feasibility is really important to us. You're not writing a history of the world or, or some sort of uh, ethnography where you're going to interview a thousand people in the course of summer. No, it's eight weeks. And you know that sounds like a lot because it's 40 hours per week. But you want to make sure that your project is completable, that it looks feasible to us. This is one of the things that your advisor will help you with. The other thing would be sustainability, and I don't mean that necessarily in an environmental way. I mean, this is something that you could continue to work on that will have importance for you and your future academic and, and perhaps even career trajectories. And your projects have to be independent of other academic projects on which you will be working, right? So. Sometimes students want to get a start on their senior thesis, you know, or something like that, or an honors thesis. You, know, you can't really do that, right? That's something that's done in the course of the semester. What we've said to students in the past is, you'll need to come up with some sort of project that is tangential to that sort of a project, and that way we can, uh, you know, accommodate both of those. Now, this is brand new, and I think that this is really going to be a significant change for us. We're still working out the details, but in the past, we have always said students have to propose their own research projects. This can't be working for uh, a faculty member. The sciences have that model, and it really fits them. Economics has that model. Those, uh, that model really works well for them. Well, we have decided that that model could also work for us in humanities, social sciences, and, and maybe even fine arts. Uh, certainly in art history, I think it would work. And what I mean by this is we are now going to be offering the opportunity to work directly with professors on their projects. So instead of the idea that you have to generate this pro proposal and project whole cloth from your interests, it is now possible in fact, to do the opposite, which is to work on their projects. As I said, we're still working out the details, but this coming early might give you the opportunity to go to a professor with whom you have a good relationship. Maybe you've already even done some research with the professor in the RA program or, or some other program, and talk to them to see if they have any research that they want done. Um, I will also be contacting department chairs to let them know about this change because we've never done it this way in the past. We've had students who've worked on faculty projects, 
but those were sort of the exception. And now I, I have a feeling that this will be a very popular option. So let me just repeat, if you want to propose your own thing, fantastic. We love that, and there are some students who are really ready for that. But I think students would also benefit from doing uh, an advisor's research as well, right? So the student-faculty uh, relationship, so I've had to update this a little bit. We used to emphasize the student originated, but now we're also introducing this faculty originated. As I said, we've had a few of these in the past. For example, so my wife um, had an exhibit, a history exhibit at the Worcester Historical Museum, and she had a couple of students who uh, did a lot of the research for that, that project, right? That was faculty initiated. She found the students and they came up with a plan. But for the most part, we've had students coming up with their proposals, finding faculty members who will support them and then working out the details for the proposal. No matter what, you have to come up with these kind of mutual obligations just so that you're on the same page with your advisors, right? You know, what are you going to be working on? What are the outcomes that you're hoping to do? How are you going to manage time? What sort of contact are you going to have with your professors? Sometimes the professors won't be here on campus, so uh, you know you have to work out whether you're going to work remotely with that professor. I mean, you're going to be here because this is residential, but they might be off campus, uh, and so you really have to hammer out the details of the faculty supervision. Right? Okay. So a couple things to keep in mind. The responsibility for what happens in your project comes down mostly to you. You can work as part of a team. Every summer we have two or even three teams of students who are working on a project. That's perfectly fine. But still, the responsibility comes down to you or your you and your partner. It's not like a classroom where you know, how much you put into it or what your responsibilities on a regular basis are, you know, that's highly variable. This one, you are going to be responsible for ways that you probably haven't experienced before, you might not. The summertime, uh, there are a lot of faculty who do not want to be involved in this because summer is really sacred for them for various reasons. So if you get rejected by a professor, please don't take that personally. Maybe it is personal, I don't know, but please don't take it personally and go and find another faculty member who's willing to work with you. I mean, they do get paid, and a lot of faculty members are here, and they enjoy working with students. There are some faculty members who will reject you because they don't think you're up to the task. And I don't mean that, that again, that personal sense. They don't think any undergrad is up to the task. Those professors, typically, you're probably not going to be asking them anyway. So, but again, keep in mind that there are some faculty members who just don't really believe that undergraduates have a lot to contribute in terms of research. We prove them wrong every summer, right? Every summer and fall when we have those poster sessions, but I don't think those professors are, are coming to our poster sessions anyway. But I know that our students do terrific work over the summer. And every so often, it doesn't work out for a student. Those are really rare exceptions. Most students have great experiences, they acquire skill, they have nice outcomes. And, and I'd like to think that they have a decent time. I mean, it's work, uh, but I, I like to make it as positive as possible for everybody. So a lot of times, 40 hours per week, and it's gonna be eight weeks of your summer. So, you know, if you wanna do a lot of things in your summer and you're, you're planning on backpacking across the American West, Maybe, but it's gonna be in August or in May. It's not going to be for those eight weeks that we're in session, right? And keep in mind also that, especially if you're a, a rising sophomore, we don't have a lot of rising sophomores in the program. It's typically rising juniors and rising seniors. The, uh, it's not, research isn't for everybody every year, right? And so just because if you don't get it this year, doesn't mean you're not gonna get it another year. In fact, we, if you have applied more than once, we typically pr try to prioritize those students. We want everybody to have this. This is also not a program that's only for you know the top 5% of students. That is not it at all. GPA is not a factor here. This is something that we want students to have as part of their experiential learning opportunities here at Holy Cross. 
And again, a lot of students would take advantage of it, but we're trying to offer this as one of these experiential learning opportunities. Okay, so here this is now going to give you a little bit of intel on writing this up. And this is also fairly general for proposals. So you can take this as specific to the proposal you're going to be writing, but you will definitely be using this probably in other proposals that you write in the future. So typically, you're going to make sure that there's a good amount of detail and you want things to be clearly defined and spelled out. You know, what sources are going to use, what background work do you need, what do you have, uh, what are your outcomes going to be. You want to spell out what are your responsibilities, what's going to be the commitment of the faculty member. And the faculty member is going to look at this, right? So before you submit this, um, this proposal, I would encourage you to come and talk to me so we can talk about it. I can look at your proposals. Uh, but also, obviously, your faculty advisor has to look at it. So you need to sort of work out a lot of the details with him or her, right, or with them. Um, you want to make sure that we understand how your summer research is connected with what you're hoping to do academically and even professionally. You need an argument. Again, you don't want to simply say, I want to look at this, or I want to examine this general field. It's not for that. It's typically because you're trying to come up with a research question that you will attempt to answer in part or in whole over the course of the summer, you know, by the end of the summer. And again, you want to tell us what you need to do this in terms of resources, what you're going, you know, amount of time that you need, uh, resources that you need, do you need to travel, do you need equipment, those sorts of things. This is a really good formulation, not only for this, but also for research papers. Okay, this is from Joe Williams, The Craft of Research. And I used to have a footnote there that would say, this was from Joe Williams, Craft of Research. Uh, Joe Williams, a famous composition professor, I think he's passed away by now. Uh, he was at University of Chicago for a million years. And he has this formulation, which is, if you think about what you're examining, it's X, Y, and Z. I'm examining X in order to see Y. So you're, you're looking at, say, a field, and you're trying to see something in there, you know, in greater detail. But the most important part of this is the argumentative part. You're trying to understand what Z is. I'm going to give you an example of this in just a moment. Right? The Z is the bigger point to all of this. You don't want to simply look at something, because that's not going to be very satisfying for your reader. Your reader can also read up on something. What you're going to be doing is you're going to be arguing something in your research and in your outcome. So if we look at my research, uh, what I uh, did in the past, if you look at the X, this is simply where I went and what I did. So I was looking at the Gonzaga family of Mantova, Italy, which is a small city-state in northern Italy. Uh, it's still there. It's still a city-state. Uh, the Gonzaga family ruled until 1707, right, from 1328 to 1707. And I was looking at the way that they interacted with their subjects in big public events. Okay, these kind of big, you know, saints' feasts, uh, jousts, uh, public uh, demonstrations, things like this. So that's generally what I was looking at. And what I was trying to find were instances in which the Gonzaga interacted with their subjects and the subjects had the opportunity to resist, right? So this was about power and the way that power is managed, negotiated, disseminated in a 15th, 16th century Italian city-state. The reason for that, okay, so if I simply went to the archive and I looked and collected a bunch of these instances where I said, okay, here's another saint's feast where they had this parade, and then they had the relic out in front, you know, with the bishop parading through the streets. Okay, that's fine, but that's kind of like collectionism. That's not, there's no argument in that. I'm simply giving you instances, like in, in a catalog. That's not very interesting. Instead, I'm trying to use this to address this question that I have about the nature of power and the limits of the power of a ruling elite 
in relationship to non-nobles, right? So, in, in effect, what I found is that a lot of these big public demonstrations were about negotiating power among elites. The ruling family needed their elites to prop them up, and a lot of these celebrations worked out these power relations. The ruling family didn't really care too much about what the common city dweller or you know, a farmer from outside the city you know, thought of them and their power. It just wasn't aimed at them. It, those people didn't have enough power to overthrow the Gonzaga. They were warlords. So instead, the Gonzaga needed their participation to make the pageant look great, but really they weren't aiming their message at these, uh, these little people, as it were, right? So do you see the X, Y, and Z here? And I really encourage you to think about this X, Y, and Z, not just for this, but also any research paper that you're writing, any of these kind of questions uh, that need answering. Okay. There is the possibility of combining your summer research with summer school. And I don't have the dates yet, so, but typically they run, I think summer school starts usually a week before we do or two weeks before we do. And essentially what you do is you work, you do summer school for six weeks, uh, so that's part-time work, and then you do two full weeks of research. So it doesn't matter whether you start in the first semester or second semester, right, you know whether you do summer school first or second semester, you will do six weeks part-time and two weeks full-time for us, okay? We have to adjust your stipend for this, but for the amount that we adjust the stipend, um, you know, because you are not working 40 hours per week, that money gets deducted from your tuition for summer school. Okay, so it's not a total loss. And you have to have your research advisor's permission to do that. And I think even if you're doing your researchers, your advisor's research, I think that they might still allow you to do summer school. Okay, that, that might be a possibility. Okay, some of the things to think about. Are you gonna need to travel? In the past, pre-COVID, we definitely had students travel. Uh, also pre-accident, uh, I'm sad to say. The accident's really changed a lot. Um, it costs a lot more for students to travel. Your professors cannot drive you. You know, you say you want to do uh, a project that involves going to an archive in Boston. Your advisor cannot drive you there, right? That's not permitted anymore. You will either have to drive yourself or take public transit or, you know, however that works. So you do want to think about that. Uh, are you going to need to travel someplace farther away? We do have travel money. Right? We have funded international travel as well. I know we sent a student to Moscow uh, a number of years ago. Uh, we had students that we had approved, and then the project fell apart to Japan. Uh, most times the travel is a little bit more modest than that, but there is the possibility of international travel. So you can work as part of a team. These are classics students. We almost always have a team of classic students, and they're working on uh, the digital manuscripts that they have up in the classics lab. So that's fantastic. Professor Neil Smith is usually their director, uh, and he's been through this a million times. And in that case, you all have the same proposal, basically, right? You just change the name, you know, for your proposal. Uh, you have to tell us what equipment you're going to need. Certainly in the arts, that's one thing, but there are plenty of other disciplines where you might be doing uh, research that's going to require some equipment. Maybe you need a recording device, for example, You know, if you're going to be doing interviews. In terms of the selection process, uh, we have another information session in January. The application will be due on March 3rd. This is sort of tentative, but March 3rd is I think that's the right date. I still have to finalize this with Professor Bertrand. We will get those back to you in about two weeks, and that way you will have a full two weeks to make your decision. We just need to know by the beginning of April so that if you can't do it, we can go to our alternates. Okay. The selection committee will be three members. I'm on the selection committee, even if I've worked with you on your proposal. Uh, and we also have the director of um, J.D. Power Center, Professor Michelle Stirk Barrett, and the Student uh, Scholarship and Action Director, Professor Mary Conley in History. Okay. And what we do is we read all the applications, we meet, and we choose the recipients. We have had years where we have had actually more awards than we had applicants. 
that would be nice uh, this year. Typically, it's not quite a two to one ratio, so typically have about 30 awards. Money varies a little bit from year to year. And in the past, we've often had about 50 applicants for those 30 spots. So good odds, but not perfect, right? And the Ignite Fund would cover these various things, right? So we typically like to say that the research money that you have is going to be about 500, and then uh, the travel money that you have is about, I think, $750. That travel money also would include if you're going to present, or if you're going to attend a conference related to your research, all the way up to a year later, right? So you do research in the summer of 2023. If you go to a conference in spring semester 2024, that would still be covered, as long as it's related to the research that you did, right? Okay, and the Ignite Fund handles that. That's why we kind of like to know ahead of time uh, what we need in terms of money. Okay. And here, the application will be online, and I will send out more details when we open that. We won't open that until the very beginning of February, and then you've got a couple of weeks to get it done. So you definitely want to work on this before we open that application. Have a lot of your details worked out. You can come see me, bounce ideas off me. I'm here. Um, I mean, I work full time, so I'm here the entirety of the break. I think we have off in between Christmas and New Year's, like usual. But I'm around other than that. So we can Zoom. You can send me your stuff, and I can take a look at it. Okay. All right, so that's all I have to say, but I'm certainly happy to take questions. Uh, I know some kind of students are shy about that. Um, I'll be in DC for the spring. Will yeah. that have any like problems with applying? Or Not at all. You'll be back in time, right? Because you actually <laughs> finish typically before everybody else yeah. in a few days, so that's not a problem at all. It might be a little difficult in terms of getting together with your professors. That's yeah. why I would advise you to do it now if you could. I think that would be a really good thing. Study abroad is tricky, right? So essentially what we've said in the past is if you're going to get back more than a week late for st from study abroad, that's going to be really tricky because you, you miss a decent amount. And I should say that this is, it's residential, it's on campus. If you have off-campus housing, right, so say you're a rising senior, you can certainly live off campus. But we do expect you here every single day. And in fact, last year we began a kind of a new approach to this, which was to have students in places where I could see them and visit them and have contact. And ideally, we want the students to be working in groups. Of course, you might be working on completely different things and different advisors, but we have found that students benefit a tremendous amount from being in regular contact with each other. So I'm on Smith uh, 3, Smith 333, and we always had a group of about seven students working in the Vanicelli uh, room, which is in Fenwick, or in 324, they were like a cohort. They were working on different things, and they had a great summer. It's so much better to do it with other people. It keeps your energy up. You can bounce ideas off of them. It's just going to be a little bit uh, more fun. So that's an important part of this, is to think that you're going to be here, and you're going to be someplace where I can find you and, and talk to you about your project and check in on you. Right? And it's not a surveillance thing. This is about making sure that you're, you're making progress, that you're not having difficulties, and, uh, and establishing this community that we're trying to build. Okay. Got some other questions or ideas. Yeah. Uh, will this PowerPoint be shared? This was taped, right? So I don't know where that will appear, but I'm sure someone from the JD Power Center will send that out or will make that known. I'm also having a second uh, info session in January. So it might be that we just share the PowerPoint, I don't know. But this has gotten better than just the PowerPoint on its own, right? You get me. You know, in purple, no less, right? I, Holy Cross purple today. Down, down, Holy Cross purple. Okay. Any other questions? And again, encourage people that you know to think about this. Second info session in January. If you're thinking about working on a team, lots of great projects over the years from teams. And certainly being part of a team, you know, two people or three people working, that's, a, that's sometimes a great dynamic. And those students 
I don't think suffer as much of the research. You know, when I was talking about the difficulties of research, one of the difficulties of research is simply isolation. You know, if you're doing your own research, you're by yourself, you're, you're in your head for eight hours a day, and that's just difficult to do. Whereas if you're part of a team and you're investigating things, that's fantastic, right? Okay, well thank you for your attention, and I really appreciate you coming out just the week before finals, and any questions, please let me know. Okay. Excellent, thank you.